Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we delve into the essential Christian text, Mere Christianity, by renowned author C.S. Lewis. Originating from his compelling radio talks during World War II, Mere Christianity is a profound exploration of Christian faith that brings to light Lewis's arguments for the foundation and the truth of Christian doctrines. It is an articulate defense of Christianity that also examines the nature of Christian life and how it shapes one's sense of morality and purpose. The author, C.S. Lewis, is not only celebrated for his contributions to English literature as a tutor at Oxford University, but also for his prominent status as one of the most influential British intellectuals of the mid-20th century. His impressive canon consists of over 30 books across both fiction and non-fiction, cementing his legacy in literature. His mastery in weaving Christian allegory into his storytelling is supremely evident in The Chronicles of Narnia, a children's series that has achieved international acclaim and sparked a series of blockbuster films. Mere Christianity is an invitation to believers eager to reinforce their faith, as well as to skeptics who wish to challenge their own perspectives. It's equally a clear and coherent introduction to the tenets of Christian belief, perfect for non-Christians curious about the faith. Whether you're a lifelong follower or simply interested in one of the 20th century's pivotal religious texts, this book offers a thought-provoking journey into the heart of Christian theology. Join us as we summarize and contemplate the enduring wisdom of C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity, Timeless Reflections in Defense of Christianity. Introduction, Discover the Transformative Power of Faith and Morality. In the throes of World War II's darkest days, C.S. Lewis's voice resonated through radio waves, offering a message of enduring faith and unwavering morality. As Britain faced the onslaught of war and the prevailing gloom of uncertainty, Lewis's words were not just a sermon, but a lifeline, a source of spiritual fortitude in a time when hope seemed a rare commodity. Lewis's words were a call to embrace the principles of decency, compassion, and the radical notion of loving one's adversaries, even amidst the turmoil. These guiding principles stand as a testament to the strength and resilience of the human spirit, urging us to uphold our moral compass, no matter the prevailing challenges. In today's world, while the clamor of battlefield may have subsided, the inner battles of despair, disillusionment, and indifference rage on. These conditions are ubiquitous, exerting a toll on the collective conscience of humanity. Nonetheless, the illuminating insights from Lewis's talks remain relevant, offering us a pathway to restore our sense of purpose and moral conviction. This narrative doesn't beckon only the devout, It summons anyone yearning for a revival of ethical sensibility in an era often colored by skepticism and existential doubt. The profound observations on life, purpose, and belief are a balm for the weary soul and a clarion call to reclaim the virtues that underpin our humanity. Throughout this engaging journey, you will discover how C.S. Lewis challenges us to truly reflect on the nature of Jesus' teachings and claims the persuasive argument for why good ultimately triumphs over evil, insights on harmonizing Christian doctrine with the scientific narrative of evolution. Join us as we delve into a renewed understanding of what it means to hold steadfast to one's faith and to navigate the complexities of morality with conviction and hope. Part 1. Unveiling the Universal Moral Compass Within Us All Have you ever noticed that when we find ourselves in the heat of a disagreement, regardless of age or culture, we tend to draw on a shared playbook of fairness and rightness? From playground squabbles to adult debates, a child's cry for justice and a partner's plea for truth echo universal sentiments that seem to transcend the particulars of each quarrel. The central insight here is, All human beings inherently recognize a universal moral law. Whether we are calling out an unfair advantage or holding someone accountable for a broken promise, 
What threads these protests together is a deeply ingrained understanding of moral expectations. It's an implicit agreement that certain standards should govern our behavior. And we assume everyone knows these rules, even those who infringe upon them. This insight is enlightening because in the moments where someone tries to justify a wrongdoing, they seldom challenge the moral principle itself. Instead, they seek to rationalize their actions within the boundaries of that principle. Excuses like financial strain or lapses in judgment are ways to appeal for an exception, not to rewrite the moral tableau. Interestingly, violations of this moral code stir an internal recognition of wrongdoing. Even when people bend, flout, or outright break these standards, a part of them understands the transgression isn't just socially awkward, it's intrinsically askew. C.S. Lewis named this inherent moral sense the law of nature, a guiding principle of right conduct understood by all human beings. Admittedly, this isn't a law of nature like gravity which is absolute and inescapable. Human moral engagement is a dance of choice and conscience. Yet, despite our freedom to defy it, there's a compelling reason to consider it law-like, the universality. This moral awareness has revealed itself across cultures and epochs, suggesting it's not simply a societal construct, but an integral part of our human fabric. Part 2. Exploring the remarkable consistency of moral values through time and space. Some voices in the debate on morality might argue that what we consider right and wrong is nothing more than a reflection of the society within which we were raised. According to cultural relativists, the metric of morality varies from one community to another, shaped by distinct customs and teachings. It's a compelling argument at first glance, but dig a little deeper, and another perspective arises. The essential message here is, despite diverse cultures and eras, moral values exhibit a remarkable consistency. If we turn to the lessons imparted on children, the cultural relativist points out that we must teach them the codes of conduct. But teaching does not imply that moral truths are societal fabrications. Consider the parallel with mathematics. Children are taught arithmetic not because it's a societal invention, but because it's a perennial truth. Likewise, the act of teaching morality links us to an enduring standard that applies universally, much like the unwavering truths of mathematics. Of course, history offers a plethora of examples where behaviors may seem morally incongruent. The ancient Roman crowds, for instance, reveled in brutality that our current age would find utterly reprehensible. But do these historical variances point to a fundamentally different moral value system? Or do they instead demonstrate instances of moral failing within a consistent framework of ethics? Upon closer examination, it becomes clear that cultural differences in morality are often overstated. Across a vast spectrum of societies and historical periods, Certain core values, such as courage over cowardice and truth over lies, stand the test of time. You would be hard-pressed to find any culture that celebrates betrayal as a noble trait or cowardice as commendable. A journey through history and across civilizations brings us back to the notion that a universal moral law presides, woven into the very fabric of human existence. This moral compass isn't a random patchwork of human whims, it's an underlying truth that binds us together in our shared humanity. Part 3. Considering moral law as a gateway to a theistic worldview. Take a moment to ponder the significance of this moral compass we've discussed. The inbuilt sense of right and wrong that guides our every interaction. This isn't just an abstract concept without consequences. It holds deep implications for how we understand the very nature of existence. Here's the pivotal insight. The presence of a moral law might suggest a tilt towards a theistic interpretation of our universe. When we try to frame our understanding of the cosmos, we often find ourselves at a crossroads. There's the materialistic view, wherein everything is the result of a long series of random events, a cosmic dice game where consciousness and morality have no hand to play. Then there's the spiritual account presenting a narrative where intention, purpose, and possibly a conscious will shape the fabric of reality. So, which narrative rings truer? One thing is clear. 
Science, for all its empirical strengths, does not possess the tools to grapple with existential why inquiries. Science excels at detailing the how of the universe but remains silent on the ultimate why, leaving room for philosophical and theological exploration. Enter the realm of introspection. By turning our gaze inward, we feel the tug of the moral law on our actions and decisions. It doesn't act with the unyielding force of physical laws, but with a powerful pull towards what ought to be rather than what is. This moral force seems unique to human experience and lies outside the scope of blind material forces. Now, does the impersonal, indifferent cosmos of the materialist account for the intrinsic value we place on humane conduct? It doesn't appear to fit. The moral law seems much more at home in a universe underpinned by a conscious mind or will, one that cares about the quality of our interactions and, implicitly, our well-being. While this contemplation doesn't hand us unequivocal proof of the Christian God, or any deity for that matter, it opens a door to the possibility that a moral consciousness underlies the universe, something that traditional materialism struggles to accommodate. It suggests that Christianity, and perhaps other theistic traditions, might offer coherent explanations for aspects of our world that elude the dissecting instruments of science. Part 4. The Profound Implications of Jesus' Divine Assertion For those still exploring the veracity of Christian beliefs, there comes a moment of reckoning with one of the faith's most pivotal claims, the divinity of Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis frames this consideration in the shape of a trilemma, an argument that presents us with three stark choices based on Jesus' self-proclaimed divinity. Here lies a profound assertion. Considering all logical angles, it appears Jesus was, indeed, more than a mere man. He was and is divine. In logic, a trilemma is a challenging crossroads of sorts, where each path leads to significant implications. For Jesus, these were the options. His claim of divinity was the truth. It was a deliberate falsehood, or it was the delusion of a madman. The enormity of each proposition is self-evident, and for many, the likelihood of Jesus being a reprehensible liar or a raving lunatic are hard to align with his life and teachings. There's an alternative some people propose, suggesting Jesus may not be divine, but was nonetheless a powerful moral influence. Yet, as per Lewis's argument, this stance fails to hold up. If Jesus was not truly divine, it leaves us with the unpalatable choices that he was either morally detestable for deceitfully claiming divinity, or so beleaguered by delusions that his moral counsel would be fundamentally undermined. Now, what draws us toward the divinity conclusion? Looking at Jesus' life, we find no pursuit of material gain no unaccounted for wealth or power that might suggest deceit for selfish gain. His teachings were paradigms of love, honesty, and humility, contradicting the character of a manipulative liar. Moreover, his life and words showcased a remarkable sanity and wisdom incompatible with delusions. It's a good rule of thumb that the simplest explanation, often, is the right one. In this trilemma, The most straightforward and cohesive conclusion is that Jesus was neither an imposter nor delusional but was, as he claimed, a divine presence. This doesn't just bear implications for Christianity. It beckons the curious and the doubting to consider the possibility that in Jesus the divine truly walked among us. Part 5. Grasping the Roots of Evil in the Realm of Human Choice A vexing question has long stood at the fore of theological debate. If a benevolent and omnipotent deity presides over our universe, why does evil persist in the world? It's an age-old conundrum, the so-called problem of evil, positing an apparent contradiction between the existence of a just, all-powerful God and the reality of human suffering. To address this, let's delve into an illuminating theodicy, that seeks to harmonize these seemingly discordant truths. The central claim we'll explore is this. The root of evil in our world stems from the gift and the burden of human free will. 
good and evil, these are not equal forces locked in an eternal struggle. Instead, there's a hierarchy of purity. Goodness stands as the foundational essential state of being, while evil is merely a distortion, a malignant shadow cast upon something inherently good. Evil cannot exist on its own. It requires the good as a host to manifest as greed, betrayal, or malice, each a perversion of something initially pure. This distinction is a cornerstone of Christian theology. The narrative of the fallen angel, Lucifer, embodies the notion that even the most egregious evil is a descent from erstwhile goodness. Confronting the problem of evil, we reach a point where it becomes evident. God, in his generosity, created a world initially devoid of suffering. Yet, through the exertion of human free will, that original purity has been tainted. The choices humans make, from benevolent acts to egregious wrongs, spring from the same well of autonomy. Now, the question arises, why would a loving God entrust us with free will, knowing the potential for corruption? Perhaps the answer is interwoven with the capacity for genuine goodness. If humans were not truly free to choose poorly, their capacity to choose goodness would equally be without merit, a hollow imitation of virtue. Understanding the relationship between morality, choice, and divine intent lays the foundation for deeper philosophical and theological revelations, which we will continue to unravel in the pursuit of wisdom. Part 6. True Christian Morality. A Journey Inward Towards Character and Purity of Heart. There's a pervasive misconception that depicts God as the supreme spoil sport, imposing rules upon humanity not for our betterment, but simply to diminish our joy. The heart of Christian morality, however, is frequently misconstrued when seen only through the lens of prohibitions and obligations. To illustrate why morality is not merely rule adherence, let's consider a parable of sorts, a person who seemingly embodies moral excellence yet harbors ulterior motives. Outwardly, he is the quintessence of kindness and generosity, yet internally, he's driven not by compassion or love, but by selfish desire for reward. Isn't there an essential element missing here? And that brings us to an enlightening revelation. Christian morality centers fundamentally on the transformation of inward character and the purity of one's intentions. This narrative is instructive because it highlights the chasm between mere moral acts and genuine moral being. True morality, the Christian perspective suggests, transcends actions and resides in the essence of who we are. It is about cultivating a moral spirit, not just performing moral deeds. Christian teachings, therefore, are not ultimately about a list of do's and don'ts. They are more like signposts leading to the development of a virtuous character. This inward metamorphosis is at the heart of the faith, reshaping the soul with love, selflessness, and goodness as its core materials. Embracing moral discipline, then, isn't about restriction. It facilitates personal growth towards a richer, more complete self. To act with genuine morality is to experience profound fulfillment and peace. Moreover, in the Christian view, this spiritual refinement is not just for earthly benefit. It prepares us for an eternal afterlife. The state of our souls in this life is seen as a prelude to what awaits beyond, urging us to foster heavenly qualities here and now in anticipation of the life to come. In sum, the Christian moral ethos invites us to delve deep within and undertake the sacred task of nurturing our souls, to incarnate the divine virtues of love and charity, and in doing so, to approach the divine. Part 7 embracing the highest example of virtue through Christ. Consider the dual paths of human existence, one rooted in the pursuit of worldly pleasures, the other oriented towards higher spiritual ideals. The first is instinctive, preoccupied with the transient satisfactions of money, status, and sensual indulgence. It is a life that echoes the primal self-serving instincts for survival and pleasure. The contrast, however, is a life devoted to eternal moral objectives. 
offering a more profound and lasting sense of fulfillment. The pivotal insight for Christians is this. Christ is revered not simply as a deity, but as the ultimate exemplar of virtue on earth. This realization strikes at the core of Christian faith, recognizing that a life centered on fleeting material gains is a life incomplete, a source of eventual discontent. Christianity awakens this awareness, not with immediate comfort, but with a profound discomfort that leads to transformation. It confronts us with the stark truth that our default earthly existence is fundamentally askew. Embarking on the Christian journey enables us to rise above our innate self-centeredness, advancing toward a state that mirrors the divine. But how does one, mired in human foibles, approach the likeness of God's perfection? Here enters the significance of Christ's incarnation. Jesus took on human form precisely to demonstrate how one can live virtuously amidst earthly trials. Through his actions and his teachings, Christ showcases the embodiment of prudence, temperance, justice, and courage. In the Christian narrative, his ultimate act of atonement, his crucifixion, stands as a testament to the depth of his virtue. To worship Christ is therefore not merely an act of religious devotion, but an aspirational embrace of the highest virtues he represents. It is a commitment to aspire to that pinnacle of ethical conduct, to infuse one's own life with the divine virtues that Jesus exemplified. For those who follow the Christian path, emulating Christ is not just a duty, it is the path to transcending the constraints of a material existence and approaching something infinitely more rewarding, a life that echoes the virtues of the divine. Part 8. The Path to Spiritual Growth Through Hope, Faith, and Charity As we delve deeper into what defines a virtuous life in the Christian tradition, it becomes apparent that certain core virtues are not just beneficial, but essential for the evolution and enrichment of our souls. Three virtues stand out as pillars of this spiritual progression, hope, faith, and charity. Here lies a profound realization. Embracing virtue is pivotal for transcending the mundanities of our material existence and elevating towards spiritual refinement. Hope in the Christian sense is not a mere wishful longing. Rather, it is a forward-looking confidence, an anticipation of the unending joy beyond the burdens of this temporal world. Critics may dismiss this as escapism, yet it is hope that infuses life with purpose and vitality. Those brimming with hope are better equipped to engage deeply with the world, having an anchor that steadies them against life's tempests. Turning to faith, we confront the critique that faith is tantamount to blind belief, a denial of reason. Such a view, however, misunderstands the true nature of faith. Far from being antagonistic to reason, faith is its ally, offering a steadfast resolve to uphold the truths discerned through reasoned thought. It is the bulwark that protects our convictions from the ebb and flow of doubt and emotional vicissitudes. Lacking faith is a sure way to be buffeted by the winds of uncertainty and to possess convictions that falter at the slightest challenge. Lastly, there is charity, extending love and assistance to those in need, often exceeding the boundaries of our natural affinities. Charity cultivates a heart of giving and goodwill calling us to act with love even towards those we find challenging to embrace. Yet herein lies a transformative secret. Through persistent acts of love, the feelings of genuine affection begin to blossom. Charity, then, not only benefits its recipient, but molds the giver's soul, infusing it with authentic love and benevolence. These virtues, hope, faith, and charity, guide us toward a higher state of being. They are healing balms for our souls, guiding lights that draw us closer to spiritual perfection and bind us more closely to the image of the divine. Through their cultivation, we rise above our base inclinations, journeying towards a realm of enduring spiritual fulfillment. Part 9. How Christianity Mirrors Our Spiritual Evolution as a Species The relationship between Christianity and evolution has been a subject of heated debate ever since Darwin's groundbreaking theory challenged traditional views of creation. Many perceive these two concepts to be in stark contradiction. However, 
An intriguing line of thought posits that there's not only harmony, but also a complementary dynamic at play between them. The insight to consider is this. Christianity can be seen as a milestone in humanity's evolutionary journey, reflecting an advance not just in biology, but in the realm of the spirit. In the context of natural selection, traits that offer a survival advantage are passed down through generations, honing the species for better adaptation to their environment. Similarly, Christianity can be understood as a spiritual adaptation, not a physical trait, but a shift in spiritual awareness and moral understanding that has enhanced humanity's capacity to thrive, just as the development of eyes allowed earlier life forms to navigate the physical world, so has the rise of Christianity illuminated a moral and spiritual landscape for humans. It has heightened our sensitivity to the moral law, a guidebook for harmonious living that aligns closely with Christ's teachings. Christianity's spread across the globe is not just a historical phenomenon. It acts as a testament to the religion's practical value for both individuals and communities. The faith champions principles like altruism and community solidarity, principles which may not always be immediately advantageous on an individual level, but which bolster the common good and, ultimately, aid in the group's longevity and prosperity. It's an echo of survival of the fittest, translated into spiritual terms. Those who internalize Christian virtues such as compassion, forgiveness, and selflessness tend to foster societies that are resilient and can weather various existential storms. Such communities can navigate through adversity while fostering a supportive and nurturing environment. Traits advantageous for both individual well-being and communal survival. Thus, from an evolutionary perspective, Christianity could be viewed as a natural progression in our species' growth, a step toward a more enlightened and enduring existence, blending our natural instincts with our spiritual aspirations. Final summary. In a world where skepticism often brushes up against spirituality, Christianity stands firm, not as an antithesis to reason and science, but as a complementary truth addressing the profound questions that lie beyond empirical reach. The essence of this narrative is clear. Faith in Christian teachings is both reasonable and enriching, offering guidance where scientific inquiry must yield. The belief that Christianity is at odds with scientific discovery is a profound misunderstanding. Christian theology doesn't rival the scientific method. Rather, It provides insights into the more enigmatic queries that science isn't equipped to tackle. The existential whys that stir in human hearts. Christianity steps into the realm of purpose, giving us a framework for understanding moral intuitions and the existence of the universe itself. Moreover, science, while offering impressive knowledge of the world, does not dictate the path we should walk through it. Christianity offers not just beliefs, but also a compass for living, a set of principles that nurture the soul and enhance communal well-being. It teaches us not just about the world we inhabit, but how best to inhabit the world. This closing summary reaffirms the potential for Christianity to coexist with the rational and scientific, urging us to consider the possibility that faith could be the most reasonable approach to life's great mysteries, directing us toward a more virtuous, communal, and ultimately fulfilling existence. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then, happy reading and happy listening.